Good afternoon. Today is um, Thursday, 26th of, uh, no, excuse me, Wednesday, 26th of uh, um, August 2020. What I'm going to do in front of you is rehearse a talk uh, that I'm going to give tomorrow um, along with uh, Vincent Bionon Galpin, who's uh, the co author of the book uh, we wrote together called uh, Comment Sauver le Genre Humain How to Save the Human Race. And uh, we've been invited to speak to the uh, new class of uh, ESSEC. ESSEC is one of the most prestigious um, MBA programs in, uh, in, in France. And um, <clears throat> Vincent is going to, um, to summarize some of the um, points we're making about how to uh, actually fulfill the program of trying to uh, save our... Um, our poor species, which is in dire straits, and um, I'm going to do some kind of introductory talk, and I was wondering what to say exactly to um, explain where we currently uh, stand. And I was thinking of something that I've done actually uh, two years ago. Uh, in 2018 to 19, I was asked to uh, give a series of uh, lectures at the Université Catholique de Lille, uh, Catholic University of Lille, where I, I still teach. And um, I'd called the, 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 the set of the, um, of the lectures um, ringing the bell, uh, ringing the alarm for the human race. And I was thinking at the time how to start uh, this series of program in a way that would be um, um, both entertaining and uh, scary enough um, so to, uh, to ring the alarm uh, properly. And I was thinking at what, what, I, what I did and uh, that's what I'm going to recycle today, uh, is talking about four, four films. Uh, these films, when they were produced, were probably called science fiction. Uh, we, we call them differently now because in most of them there's hardly any science at all. Uh, some have some science, some, some not. Uh, the, more, the, um, uh, the, the phrase um, speculative fiction that's been used sometimes for that type of li literature would be better. And now we call them, we, we use the term dystopian. Uh, as opposed to um, utopian, uh, to uh, tell about a world that uh, turned really sour and uh, where problems are shown in a very spectacular way most most of the time in these um, using the um, uh, possibilities that the cinema and in particular new numeric <laughs> um, pixelization allows now to um, show things that hopefully we'll we'll, we'll never see. The, the films, um, I, I'm, I'm f I first give, give the name of the, uh, the four movies, the four films that I, I remember, that I decided to, uh, to talk about. The first one is an, a 1958 movie, uh, still black and white, by Stanley Kramer. It's called On the Beach. And um, uh, it's from a, a novel that was, was published one year before. And it's a story of um, a post-nuclear um, disaster. And... Um, Everybody on the earth has been removed from uh, the surface of our globe, uh, except that in one country, which is Australia. And um, there's a submarine, uh, the last surviving uh, crew uh, coming from the United States and go, go, going to Australia. And, and something is happening in the States which justifies that the submarine goes back, trying to find out where there's any hope left. And um, that's the first movie. It's very much in the, in the, in the spirit of the time when, when we were right in the middle of the uh, Cold War, uh, a threat of uh, nuclear, the, the nuclear um, thermonuclear disaster was uh, um, realistic. And it, it could very well happen. And I'll come back to, to that uh, to, today. The second movie is uh, 1984, The Terminator, uh, from James Cameron. Uh, everybody's familiar, I believe, with that movie. Uh, what's happened is that from the future, a, um, a couple comes back uh, to visit us in 1984. Um, a, a robot and, um, and a human being. And uh, the, the reason is that the robots are trying to kill uh, in the womb uh, a child that will be born and will be 
leading the rebellion on the remaining human beings against the robots that have uh, taken power. Um, the movie is quite spectacular. Um, television series has been made. There have been a number of further episodes, um, sequels to that, that, that movie. I, I don't have to explain what it is. Everybody knows about that particular movie. Number three is uh, 2013 from Neil Blomkamp, um, a South African uh, director. Uh, Elysium, Elysium about a world where uh, humanity, humankind is, is split between uh, two um, two types. It's a bit like the same theme as the H.G. Wells um, the time machine um, from the late 19th century. Uh, two types of human beings. Uh, some have become immortal and live in a space station and the remaining other humans which are still mortal live in a totally uh, derelict and uh, totally gloomy uh, a uh, place where uh, the earth is actually scorched and um, well I don't have to give any further details um, that's Elysium number four uh, from, from the following year um, Interstellar uh, from uh, Christopher uh, Nolan who uh, is just actually uh, releasing now a quite interesting <laughs> also movie called Tenet um, in, in Elysium, uh, we've uh, ruined um, the Earth as uh, being a possible dwelling for human beings. And um, the only thing we can do is trying to find some other planet somewhere uh, in order to uh, colonize there in, 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 into space. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to cover the themes of these four movies, but I will not do it in the chronological uh, order of the release of the, um, of the movies. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the themes possibly uh, from the least scary to the most scary uh, of them all. Uh, let me start with um, Elysium. Elysium about a world where um, the concentration of wealth has become such that there's a, there is a problem that the problem is to the extent that, that the remaining uh, uh, the remnants of humankind on, on still on, on, on the surface of the earth are trying to are rebelling and are trying to acquire the status of immortal like the uh, like the one percent which is living on the uh, living on the um, space station the uh, satellite around the earth quite amusing little detail. Um, the um, the ruthless leader, female leader of the uh, immortals, uh, was copied. I imagine quite deliberately on the uh, on Madame uh, um, Madame Lagarde. Uh, at the, the head of the um, International Mon Monetary Fund. Um, and the um, the part was played by uh, Jody Jody Foster. Uh, Elysium, a world where population is entirely split between the two types of uh, humanity, humankind that um, hardly connect at all and uh, the fates have totally diverged. Um, this may happen. This may happen. We, we, the, the, um, how would I say, in the, in the, um, in the wake of uh, the 2008 uh, subprime crisis, there's been there, there was a lot of, of, of talks about the fact that um, although in, in a prior crisis that of 1929 that the rich had lost a lot of, of money and of their wealth uh, in 2008 they had, they actually had found ways to um, not to suffer at all from what what had happened um, one of the um, ways. That, that turned out to be is that the uh, governments took the money of everybody else from the taxpayer to save the, the save the rich who didn't lose any money at all. They had also um, finance, and I shouldn't say too many uh, nasty things about finance, which uh, allowed me to uh, to earn a, a decent living for 18 years. Um, finance had developed a, a particular financial instrument, um, a derivative called credit default swap, which allowed uh, anyone to um, um, to protect oneself against loss from uh, um, from loans that would not be uh, refunded, not not be repaid properly, and the interest or the interest not being uh, 
are being paid. And uh, so protection, how would I say, capitalists had found a way to protect themselves against, against, uh, um, against the risk of a major crisis like the 1920. Nine. Uh, one aspect was uh, through um, um, the, the, the designing uh, financial instrument. The other one was through um, a method that can work, uh, always works, uh, and was to bl blackmail the rest of the population, which is essentially why, why the, the, when the people, when the people would actually produce the insurance uh, to the credit default swap, when, when they defaulted, um, they were bailed out by, by governments for a reason which it's uh, to me uh, still obscure um, 12 years 12 years l later uh, we measure the um we measure the inequalities through something which is called the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient allows you to look for particular countries, um, for individual countries, what is the dispersion of, of um, and the con concentration of wealth within within a, a country. Uh, the, the worst case currently uh, cases are in uh, Latin America, um, and they are in uh, South South Africa um, and other countries in in the uh, southern part of. Of, um, of Africa, which used to be a, a, the British a, a Empire. Um, other countries are not faring too well in that respect uh, either, uh, like the United States, where concentration of wealth is much higher than, the, than in, in, in Europe. Um, there are ways to, uh, for countries to try to fight uh, the concentration through taxation, uh, through uh, social security systems, with, which redistribute to some extent the, uh, the amount. Um, but we've seen after 2008 the um, concentration got higher and not lower just for reasons that I already said. Why is it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because it creates inequalities in, in societies. Inequalities uh, contribute to the fragility of a society. When, when uh, wealth is better distribution, countries are more re resilient. I have a colleague. Uh, I have a colleague who uh, made a simulation about how much how much taxation should be needed in order for the, for the, our um, social systems to stabilize. And there's a, there's a nice little uh, videos videos that he made uh, that show was different levels of concentration of wealth. Um, wide fluctuations when the Gini index is is. Um, is uh, very very high, meaning that uh, wealth has concentrated a lot of uh, variation, which every time fluctuation, which shows uh, actually of course weaknesses and and, and fragility, and um, if you take more money from the richer the system, it becomes much much. Uh, much more stable, much more res resilient, which is that what the, um, Bismarck, uh, who was not a not a friend of the of the left at all, in the um, at the end of the nineteenth century in Germany, that's why he invented social security uh, to some extent. It had existed in different countries for, in particular, for the military before, but. He, uh, he made it a generalized system, and not because he, he liked the poor or the working class, but because he was fearing, like uh, the people at the top of society, uh, that there might be revolutions and that would be uh, dangerous for the country as, as a whole. So, um, Elysium, uh, concentration of wealth and why it's not a good uh, good thing. Um, second, second theme, um, the one from uh, Interstellar, Interstellar, the double theme, uh, we've ruined the, the Earth, and uh, the only thing we can do in order to survive is to find some other planet somewhere uh, in order to go and, and, and live there. Um, what does that refer to? Um, well, we know. There's something called the carrying capacity for a species. What is the carrying capacity for a species? It's a, it's a term that comes from, uh, from uh, biology. And um, it means that for a particular environment, there's only so many uh, animals or, or people that you can put there without making the, um, the environment degrading in such a way that it won't be possible to keep so many people for, for, for much further. Um, we have that, um, you know, when you hear these figures like saying, uh, oh, this, this year the um, 
the date is actually uh, the 3rd of August uh, in terms of re renewability uh, of, the, um, of the years, meaning that by the 13th of August, you've already exhausted what, what is really renewable on, 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 on in the world, in the environment uh, around us uh, for a species uh, li like ours. That's the notion of uh, carrying capacity. And the fact is, you, you can do two things uh, in order to deal with that. Uh, you can either reduce the number if the carrying uh, capacity has been entrenched if you go too far and things are um are, are becoming uh, difficult and uh, threatening in, in, in the long term, um, you, you can do that, reduce the number of people. The other thing is you can improve the carrying capacity of the environment, like through um, an agricultural revolution of things of that type, you can do that too. And we've been, as a species, we've been doing both. Uh, we've tried to think about the population levels and uh, we've been thinking about how to improve the carrying ca capacity of our environment. Sometimes we fear that um, being not too good at the, at the control, we turn to, um, how would I say, involuntary mechanisms. Like it's, um, if you think of the First World War, which uh, in, in the countries where it took place and also to the country, in the countries that contributed in the major way, like the United States, uh, New Zealand, Australia, uh, a quite considerable uh, number of young men in the, in the class of, uh, let's say, 20 to, uh, to 40 uh, was depleted. And um, making it to some extent it easier for the societies they, they were part of uh, to restart with a depleted number of people. Uh, but that's a totally involuntary mechanism. Unfortunately, we human beings, although we think a lot, uh, sometimes we resort uh, unconsciously to mechanisms of the, that, that type. The danger is there. Uh, I don't have to go into the details. Uh, rising temperatures, um, climate change, um, uh, rising waters in the oceans, um, the depletion of the uh, ice uh, reserves on, on the earth, and so on. Uh, you know about that. You know the risk that we we. Uh, that we're taking currently. Uh, this, what about the solution of going into space and uh, settling uh, colonies on other uh, on other planets? Um, some people are working actively on that. Uh, Mr. Elon Musk with his company X, um, SpaceX. Uh, Mr. Bezos, um, well known at the head of uh, Amazon and with his comp uh, company called um, Blue Origin. They're working on that. The difficulty is that uh, it's very expensive. Um, we, we haven't found a good place to go as an alternative, and we are not well equipped as the human beings. We are not well equipped at all uh, for space travel. Um, we're destroyed by uh, cosmic rays. Um, we're not too good. Uh, we all know that. We're not too good to live uh, in a confined er environment for um, very long uh, without some major conflicts de developing. We're not too good at, at that. We can think about it, but it will still be some time before we can really uh, go to other planets, uh, colonize them, uh, develop um, terraforming, which is to create an atmosphere for us to live there. Um, we're working on it, and I would say we're working quite quite fast on it, but um, we're not there yet, and by very far. Uh, we shouldn't uh, really re consider it right now as being a solution which is workable in the, uh, how would I say, in the imaginable future uh, very soon. Uh, third movie, third film, The Terminator. Um, the theme being that we've been at very good human beings at something, which is to develop uh, artificial intelligence, and so much so that the machines decided we are, we, we are human beings, we are liability for the future of the planet and getting rid of us. Um, how realistic is it that we can develop a machine that are sufficiently intelligent and autonomous um, that this would be a, something, a possibility at all. And there, um, because, essentially, because I've been a researcher in artificial intelligence at some point in my, my life, uh, that uh, I was very enthusiastic at the time, and I'm still very enthusiastic at the time, I still kind of um, look at what was, was going on there in that field. Uh, I'm convinced that 
that's something that's probably uh, more feasible, maybe, definitely, uh, than to uh, colonize space in a workable uh, time frame, um, and possibly uh, saving the planet is a way for us to, to survive. Uh, I, I'm, I'm confident in one thing in particular, which is that um, machines are... Um, by now already, uh, they are more intelligent, intelligent than intelligent than than we are, um, and that um, they can provide solutions to some of our problems. Unfortunately for us, in ways that will be difficult for us to grasp. Uh, there's that image which circulates in the. Um, and the, and the milieu of artificial intelligence people of that uh, chimp it was in a cage in, in a zoo and two of his attendants there are uh, are discussing whether to move him or her uh, from one cage to the other and uh, and the chimp doesn't know has no idea what's going to happen why because the chimp has no way of understanding the conversation ar around him or her and uh, my feeling is that we've reached already by now, that stage with artificial intelligence. And the difficulty, the main difficulty, in my view, will be the following. It will be to trust the machine in having found the solution. And in that respect, I'm not too con confident at all. Why is that, uh, why is it the case that we will not recognize easily that the machine is finding the solution. First, because it will operate like us through neural networks, uh, through artificial neural networks, our, ours are, are natural. And it's a very complex system where, where a lot of, effort, most of the effects are what's called in, in mathematics nonlinear, meaning that it's, it becomes very quickly impossible really to, re, to, to find out exactly what, what, what happened. So we will have to trust them, although not understanding entirely uh, the way they got to their conclusions. And the, but the most frightening to me currently is the thing, a thing called algorithmic bias, which is that we systematically, systematically don't believe what the machine is finding because we have some prejudice and uh, that we have that we are supposed to be in one way or other as human beings that some differences exist and then some don't and when we see the machine that's proceeding i would say in a much more scientific thorough way looking just at the data and and driving some consequences some conclusions from that we don't really trust because of uh, what I would call uh, political correctness, because the machines find finds things that we don't like. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, we say that the machine is pre prejudiced, but the fact is that the sad truth is that it's just the reward, the reverse. We are not prepared to see the truth as it is. And I think that the danger will, will be there. Uh, I already see it around me. Uh, people who produce very good system are asked to tweak, uh, to tweak the, 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 the results from the machine. Uh, because, let me give you an example, uh, because kids are not as smart as uh, we expect them to be. And we say, well, the machine must, must be prejudiced. Well, no, the machine is just seeing what it sees, right? And if the machine sees, that the kids now are not as clever as they were in 1950, uh, we can try to treat the system, and uh, but it won't help us. We'd better trust the machine in finding out what, what, what is there and uh, not trying to be smarter than the machine that is already by now uh, smarter than us. Final film uh, on the beach, and I won't have much to say about that, just, uh, just a warning. Um, in the 1960s, uh, some of us lived in the 1960s, it, it's my, my, my case, and um, it was scary. It was, uh, of course, there was rock and roll, there was Elvis Presley and Gene Vincent and uh, Eddie Cochran and Buddy Holly, uh, but we were pretty scared uh, because the risk of a nuclear war was there. And um, what I'm going to say is the following. Uh, we shouldn't discard the idea, the whole idea, that uh, the risk is now nothing. When, when I looked on Wikipedia about some figures just right now, uh, it was said, well, the risk is essentially that some rogue nation or some uh, rogue uh, terrorist uh, gang uh, would try to get, uh, get hold of the nuclear weapons. I think there's a much major, there's another um, risk 
First, there is that we start a new Cold War, and uh, we're just about this from doing it, right? Okay, between China and United States. And uh, when you put at the head of uh, some of these countries um, leaders who are totally bonkers, I hope you understand the, the word, um, that's not making things easier. That's not reducing the, the risk. You remember when Trump was elected, that the doom, doom clock, uh, telling us how, how close we are from doom, uh, that it moved right, just right, one bit. <laughs> I don't remember how many seconds or even a whole min minute, um, just because we had elected somebody who was a rogue by, 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 him, by himself. So the danger is there. And uh, we know also there's, there's I'm, I'm, I'm an anthropologist and sociologist by training. If one thing is quite clear with human beings, uh, and with, with countries, uh, with nations, is that when, when there are some problems which are there of their own making, and that uh, people, are, that nations are in real trouble, the temptation, and for the individual people also, to say that there's some stranger, uh, some other people somewhere who are the cause of all our, our troubles. The temptation is so high uh, that I don't think that we have actually removed altogether the risk of a nuclear war. Uh, I do, I do believe personally that every day that we are not tackling the ecological problems, the problems of the carrying capacity of our species, every day we're making the risk that one, we one day explode some of these bombs again, and. Um, and I, I was looking at the figures, uh, not, not recently, but um, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And I know if you explode, less than 1% of what we have currently as being the uh, nuclear head, head, heads that we have everywhere in the, in the world, if you use even 1% or less than 1%, you already develop a nuclear winter meaning that crops will not happen for a full, full year. And uh, that means that even if, if people manage you know, to live in bunkers for some, some time, it means that uh, nuclear famine will be around the corner. And um, nuclear famine means uh, civil wars. Uh, people are uh, locked up somewhere in a the bunker. They won't be able to stay there forever. That risk also from the 1958 on the beach film from Stanley Kramer uh, on the beach and then from novel the novel from Neville shoot that risk is still there and I think it will be increasing over the coming years unfortunately thank you